Aloha, and welcome back to The Creative Life from the American Creativity Association on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleese, and today on the show, we will be discussing the topic of a new book called Pipe Dreams, The Urgent Global Quest to Transform the Toilet, written by our guest, Chelsea Wald. This is a live streaming show where you can send questions by email to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. Chelsea is a science journalist based in the Netherlands with a degree in astronomy from Columbia University and a master's in journalism from Indiana University. Chelsea has more than 15 years experience in writing about science and the environment. Chelsea has replete, repeatedly plunged into the toilet since, 19, uh, since 2013, when editors first approached her to write about the potential in our stagnating sanitation infrastructure. Seeing an age-old crisis needing to be solved, that is sanitation on a global scale, Chelsea wrote the book, Pipe Dream and it describes creative, innovative, and even transformative solutions to the sanitation crisis and the obstacles that those solutions receive when they're trying to be introduced. Today, Chelsea analyzes three solutions with us on the sanitation solution journey. One is container-based sanitation in Haiti. Another is a simple septic system in Indonesia. And the third is a urine diversion toilet in modern day Europe. So with that, Chelsea Wald, aloha. Aloha. Okay, Chelsea, I want to start out before getting into the specifics of your book and the sanitation crisis. Since this is a show on creative problem solving, can you describe what solutions journalism is and how one could go about doing it? Yeah, so solutions journalism is a growing approach to practicing journalism that I felt was really appropriate to this particular topic, in part because of how I came to it, which was through encountering in my work, a wide variety of innovations um, around sanitation that actually pointed to the fact that there was a larger problem um, all around the world that I that I, I I hadn't really known the full scope of. And solutions journalism um, is a little different from traditional journalism that really focuses on the problem. So kind of the classic expose where you would um, sort of uh, delve into um, the depths of a, of, of a big problem facing society. Solutions journalism looks at the problem, but what it does is it centers the responses that people um, are engaging in to help solve that problem. And so by looking at the solution that people are uh, that people are implementing on the ground, then you can also take a look at the problems. And it's not just a um, approach that looks at um, that that just uplifts solutions and makes people feel good. It actually uses data um, and interviews on the ground research to. Uh, take us take a hard look at solutions. Look at what's working. What are the barriers, and whether these solutions can be implemented in other places, or whether they're really specific to the places in which they are being implemented. You know, to really um, in query whether the solution um, could be a good fit for other places around the world as well. And um, what practitioners of Solutions journalism believe, hope, and there's some evidence building around is that this approach is, is less depressing, um, less divisive, and more constructive um, approach to journalism. And uh, I think that's important when you're talking about sanitation because, uh, in fact, because the global crisis around sanitation can get very depressing um, and divisive. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating. And I think you're going to be 
telling us three different ways that you customize or you journalize around the customization of these creative and innovative solutions. And uh, I, can you talk about it? So walk us through your journey today uh, mm -hmm. to these three places in the world where you introduce solutions journalism. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll tell you about three solutions that I encountered and investigated in some detail um, during my work for this book and in my other journalism work. Um, the first one, the first place I like to tell you about is Haiti, and this is an example of the global um, sanitation crisis. A lot of people may know already that many people in the world don't have safe toilets to use. Um, uh, in fact, about half of the world's population doesn't have what's known as safely managed sanitation, and what that means is that their toilet waste, as I like to call it, doesn't make it safely to treatment. Um, there are many ways that this can go wrong. And in that picture you saw, that's a pit latrine um, that I saw, that's me in front of a pit latrine in um, Haiti. Uh, and this is really just a hole in the ground. Um, and it, it doesn't really have a proper cover or a seat on it. It's not very private. It's in someone's backyard. And when I saw it, it was flooding in the area in this um, uh, low income area and it was overflowing. So this is a, a, a very problematic um, toilet that I saw, but I was there to go look at a creative solution that um, is part of a movement called container-based sanitation. Um, and that's slide three. Um, this is actually, it's in a way it's a throwback because in the 19th century there was, um, a movement toward this kind of sanitation before the sewer arose. And what you're looking at is a container, like an outside toilet. It looks like a toilet, but inside there's really a container um, that uh, it, it is not connected to um, an, a sewer system or infrastructure system um, like that. But on the next slide, um, you'll see it's actually connected to a different kind of infrastructure, a series of wheelbarrows, and trucks that then take what ends up in the container um, and someone's home to a composting center where um, poop gets transformed into a um, rich compost that can be used in the depleted soils of Haiti. Um, and uh, this is, this is a, a solution that has climate benefits and it's, provide, it's got privacy benefits because instead of going out into someone's backyard or going over to a neighbor's pit latrine, people can have these in their homes regardless of the infrastructure that they have in their homes. Um, this, what I found um, when I was visiting Haiti looking at the solution was that one of the reasons that this, this really works there is because the providers, the company that's doing this is very integrated into the community. And I found that that's really important. They've been there over a decade building trust with people. Um, and, and so people are willing to pay a little bit of money um, to have the service provided to them. And um, so that that's one of the, the ways, that's one of the Sort of soft skills ways that enables this sort of technological solution to be implemented. Um, but the and and there's many more places like this sort of urban low income area in Haiti where this could be implemented um, around the world and is being implemented. And then we have to consider places where it might not be appropriate. So one of the things that came up as I was looking into container-based sanitation is that. There are areas like this, for example, um, in South Africa. However, under apartheid, uh, bucket toilets were the only type of sanitation available to black populations that were you know, being oppressed at the time. And so they have very negative connotations with this idea of a bucket. And so um, many people think this isn't for that reason, for historical reasons, for culture reasons, 
um, that this is not an appropriate solution for that context. So it's about marrying the technology and the culture together. Well, and I want to focus on that point because there were there were really two leading aspects to your talk with us today about creativity. One is this solutions-based journalism. And that is it, that sort of at the intersection of fact and creativity and then implementation. Uh, and the second part that came out of, of our interview was this cultural resistance to taking a solution and implementing it immediately to a crisis. And they, they, you just talked about soft skills. And that is a different aspect of being creative. You can come up with your solution, but how do you sell it? And um, you might be sharing with us, I hope, a little bit going forward here, what some of those soft skills are for the creatives and innovators watching the show. What do you need to do to bypass or, and even engage the cultural resistance and make it a cultural acceptance? And you're talking about something with a lot of taboo, uh, a lot going all the way to whether it's apartheid or just being clean. What are some of those solutions that you work with or observed and can share with us about getting your creativity accepted? Yeah, because of the nature of sanitation, which comes along with very strong um, emotions and psychological reactions around taboo, as you mentioned, around privacy, um, it is a really good case study for um, how to what what needs to be done in order to make change because people are quite resistant to changing how they do things in the bathroom. And that's completely understandable to the extent that you don't have to change how people do things. Um, you know, engineers are really looking at that, but sometimes you really do. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see in Indonesia, um, a helicopter toilet. This is a traditional kind of toilet in Indonesia thought to be um, perfectly uh, acceptable. It's a, I'm standing on this plank, you will walk out this plank and, and then there's a, a, a hole on a platform um, over the running water behind the house. So there's a big river back there and you just um, feed the fish, you know, <laughs> so to speak. And, um, and this was considered to be a perfectly acceptable form of sanitation in Indonesia. And, uh, and, and changing that requires changing attitudes as well as convincing people to spend money on things that they wouldn't normally have to spend money on because sanitation is interesting because it's a, it's a mixture of of a private and a, and a public responsibility. So usually there's, a, there's a, a certain portion that a household has to pay for, and there's a certain portion that the government um, pays for. Um, and you know it's sort of like a whole collaboration. And the gentleman I was um, talking to in, in Indonesia, his name is Pak Poon, and he is, and Pak means Mr. It's an, it's an honorific, but everyone calls him that, and I do too. Um, and he is a, a salesman uh, who sells toilets. He had been actually a, an electronic salesman when he got into this field. And um, he has changed you know, his whole business or, or to, to, to sell toilets to people who don't otherwise have safe toilets. And I got to win. So, so mm -hmm. this, is a, this is the soft skills side of selling creativity. So Michael's shown us the next slide too. So tell us what he has to do to sell mm -hmm. this taboo, changing taboos sort right. of uh, investment in. The, te the technology he's selling is, is nothing really, um, really exciting, but it works. You know, it's, it's a, it's a container in the ground that contain, it's like, you know, a, a, a septic tank, he calls it. It's very basic, um, but it, it works. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah, and so what he's doing is he's holding up in that picture um, a paper mache poop that he has um, that he has made himself. And in his other hand, he has food that he has brought for all the people who are. You can't see them all, but there's a crowd of 
of local people from this community who have come to see his sales pitch. And what he's doing is he's using kind of the emotion of disgust as well as humor. He's terribly funny um, to, to teach people, to have people feel at a visceral level what it means to have poop in the environment. It touches your food and then it goes around. And if you eat the food, you're eating, you know, poop or your the poop is touching you. And I watched him do this with everybody around. And he did this many times, he told me over several years. And finally he convinced everybody in the community to um, switch over. And the community aspect is also very important because sanitation uh, is a community effort. Um, you can have a toilet, but if your neighbor doesn't have a toilet, your toilet doesn't help you all that much um, because it's really your neighbor's poop that's the problem for you. Okay, so innovators take note. Uh, you might have to do show and tell. You might have to do paper mache. Uh, but just because you came up with the, the new wheel, uh, there's going to be this resistance. And, um, and Chelsea's here to show us ways around it. Uh, how about some more? Where, where are you taking this next on the journey? So I'm going to take you into my own bathroom next on this journey. All right, then. <laughs> Actually, outside my home in the Netherlands, I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. today, but I live in The Hague. And this was uh, not the current house, but my previous house. And that's me standing outside my house. You can see the bicycle. And I'm holding jugs filled with my own urine. And in the next slide, you'll see how I collected this urine. Um, this is, I, I would pee into that um, pitcher and then I'd pour the pitcher into the jug uh, there. And then someone would come by once a week in a truck to pick it up. Now, why would they do this? <laughs> um, I was pregnant at the time. And in the first um, several months of pregnancy, um, people make, uh, a hormone called HCG that can be used as a fertility drug. And since 1931, there's an organization in the Netherlands called Mothers for Mothers that has been collecting pregnancy urine um, and making a fertility drug out of it. It goes to a pharmaceutical company um, and it's a, it's a, a donation. Um, but there's really a lot of a lot better reasons, I have to say, because the, this, this, not that fertility isn't worthwhile, it really is, but the, this is, can also be made synthetically. But there's actually a lot of reasons, um, other reasons to co collect urine. This can be called source separation as well, um, not to mix everything in together. And um, one big reason why is that urine is a great source of local nitrogen, which is um, a fertilizer. Um, and right now, the, we can say that, you know, there's fertilizer shortages around the world because of the war in Ukraine. And so we can see why it is really important to have alternate sources other than the synthetic um, nitrogen fertilizers that are, are made and, you know, uh, and imported from other countries. Um, and, and so uh, there's, and there's a lot of other reasons um, that source separation is a really great approach um, for changing the type of sanitation that's used even in places that are considered to have very good sanitation systems um, that have sewers, that have wastewater treatment plants, but that those systems aren't necessarily like well suited for the challenges, many of the challenges of the future, including shortages of um, fertilizers, shortages of water, um, and climate change in general. But the problem is, mm -hmm. well, I wanted to catch up. So think about the problem, but I just want to get, I just want to catch up where we are on our journey. Yeah. We went to Haiti and saw these pit latrines and you saw local innovators or maybe international innovators. We didn't touch on that. Who came up with the better mousetrap or poop trap, whatever you want to call it, uh, for containerizing and then taking away the, the taking it away instead of leaving it in the pit. So it's not going into the local agricultural areas un, uh, uh, uncontrollably. And, and you showed us the containers. And then in Indonesia, we saw the helicopter solution. And were those containers that came in there 
uh, did they introduce the was the innovation a container in that one or uh, what was that in in that case the so-called helicopter toilet which is an unsafe solution was replaced by something known as a septic system or there which is basically a container underground an underground container it was a very simple uh solution yeah so we went from underground to containers and then helicopter above ground into a septic field and so that's one one area in Haiti they needed the one and in Surabaya and in Indonesia they needed this other solution but they both were sitting there in the last you know modern times with unsolved sanitation issues and then you took us to Europe and you shifted not so much from the collection uh, or distribution model for sanitation, you showed us a way to separate, collect, and reuse human waste uh, to make it uh, human fertilizer or human pr uh, products or you know, helping with fertile, um, fertility. So that's a third. So when you opened up the Pandora's box of sanitation, as a solutions journalist, you saw a lot of movement doing brand new things in different ways uh, about this most basic of functions and that every community has four, at least four or five times a day to deal with times the number of people in the world. Yes. Pretty, so am I, am I caught up uh, on, on what we just saw? Yes, it's it's really that everywhere in the world, you know, has a sanitation need, um, including um, places that that have uh, what is considered to be the gold standard of sanitation, um, which is which people are now realizing uh, it is perhaps not the best solution for our future. Yeah, so we need an innovation everywhere. That's right. Okay, and then I stopped you because you said there was a problem. Even of course, it looked like a problem to me for you to pee into a bucket and pour it into a jar. Uh, have there been improvements on that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. one of the problems with the idea of source separation is that people won't accept it uh, because it requires doing something differently. Um, there have been what's called urine diverting toilets that have been um, developed uh, until now, but they've still been awkward to use. There's a new one in this uh, slide that um, we're looking at here that has been developed in Austria, and it works in a way that's almost completely invisible to users. So if you had this in place of your current toilet, you would see um, that the urine, uh, you, you wouldn't see anything. But what would happen is that the urine sticks to the wall because of the teapot effect and flows, what's called the teapot effect. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like a dribbling teapot when the water comes and flows down the side of the teapot instead of going into your, into your drink. But in this case, the urine goes into a separate hole in the toilet from the hole that the poop flops down into. And in that way, this toilet, which is now um, available in Europe, um, that this separates the urine from the west, rest of the toilet waste. And it can be separately collected and treated. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done um, regarding the infrastructure for collection and treatment, but uh, it is in process. That's from a new article that I recently wrote in February for, Na for the magazine Nature, so you, the journal Nature, so that you can you can go check that out if you'd like as well. Um, um, that that graphic was made by that team. Um, yeah, so so that's exciting because it is this idea of creating this major change, but it shows that you know it's much easier when you can make the change invisible to the people who have to use it or nearly well, yeah not just easier but scalable i mean it, and know, scalable yeah you were a bit of a guinea pig 
peeing into your, into the bucket, and and this will co could come in. Now I suppose there's a cost, and uh, there's re retooling and introducing this, and I don't even know different. I suppose there's different countries that would have legis social legislation around using the hormones, uh, but it isn't just for collecting the hormones. In your case, it was. You talked about new fertilizer sources, mm -hmm. organic rather than synthetic, and you also talked about new fuel sources uh, that uh, that come from that. Now I remember in reading my Pearless Buck books, the Good Earth and the Good Earth series, she talked about in China that they they did waste collection. The farmers did, and it made all the difference in the fertilization and in in their areas of the world and and uh, no doubt in every continent in that day and age and before and what you're you're bringing us back to is that modern day solutions are ignoring age old um remedies and uh recyclable uh activities that that these new solutions can bring back so we're kind of going back to nature with our new, um, our new technology. And what I talk more about that. Yeah, what I discovered really was that um, right now we have one so-called gold standard, the sewer connected to the wastewater treatment plant, the flush toilet that everyone is aspiring to if they don't have it already. But what we need for the future is to move away from that one size fits all idea Right. And depending on what the local resource, what, what's needed locally, what's possible locally, what the local cultural context is, we need a wide variety of toilet solutions and innovations um, that we can tap into um, so that we have a kaleidoscope of options instead of just one standard of toilet. So Michael put up an interesting slide is this is this an example of some of the multiple solutions um this is a slide that uh that i don't know that we have time for but this is the back end infrastructure for urine diversion this is how source separation could work for example these are the options beyond the gold standard that you could use you could collect at the toilet you can collect in a building you can collect on a farm or in a house and you can have a lot of different ways to transport pee and poop um, so yes, in a way, this is this is a example of the myriad ways in which these um, these can be implemented. Right. Yeah. And did you look at all at what NASA does? And we know we do have improvements in that whole system from the work of the astronauts. And and maybe you didn't. I I didn't ask you that before, but um, just wondered if you knew what the innovations were coming out of space travel. Well, it is really interesting um, what's coming out of space travel. N those toilets <laughs> are the most expensive toilets in the universe, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but they, you know, the goal that NASA has for space exploration is, um, you know, really using all of the resources again, um, you know, because you can't waste resources when you're on Mars. But, um, but one of the researchers I talked to who works on NASA toilets and who also works on toilets for very low income urban contexts said to me, you know, these are all resource limited contexts. It's just um, the budget that's different. <laughs> hey, well, on that note, on budget, I'm going to have to close our show today. It's been delightful to have you. Uh, I want to let the audience know again that you have been watching The Creative Life on Think Tech Hawaii. And today I have been discussing the importance of solutions journalism and cultural barriers to getting innovation implemented with our delightful guest, Chelsea Wall, who is an author and science journalist. Uh, mahalo for participating and mahalo to all of our viewers for tuning in. I am Phyllis Bleese and we will be back in two weeks for another edition of The Creative Life. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.